Hello everyone. Last week we covered four really interesting sets of battle armor that could be game changers in your next game of Battletech. The feedback was so positive, I figure we could just keep going. Today's set includes a general purpose design you're going to see in official CGL plastic form soon, as well as a few which definitely should be seen in the future if the Battletech gods favor us. Let's get going and see what we can find in these technical readouts. Our first set of battle armor highlights one of the odd curiosities of the clan invasion of the Inner Sphere. After seeing how the elemental armor behaved as a force multiplier for the standard infantrymen, the houses of the Inner Sphere decided that perhaps it might be worth spending some time and effort protecting the otherwise easy to slay foot soldier. Designers were forced to dig through some historical documents and long abandoned scientific papers to find the engineering know-how required to produce their own battle armor. Eventually, once the clan started taking losses in the field, retrieved examples of the elemental suit were also reverse engineered. Even with the money and resources being dumped into developing a homegrown inner sphere battle armor, progress was slow as replicating the clan technology was difficult. The process of miniaturization has always been an endgame challenge. Back in the 20th century, the Soviet Union, which had long been known for having creative and savvy engineers, struggled with making their technology fit into smaller packages. We see this today with the lingering differences between the Inner Sphere and Clan weaponry and other technology. Still, the engineers across the Inner Sphere kept working. Eventually, rough copies of the Clan Elemental Battle Armor started to go through testing. The Federated Commonwealth's New Avalon Institute of Science is credited with pushing the first designs into field testing with FedCom soldiers and within the Grey Death Legion mercenary unit. Those first Inner Sphere battle armor designs were lacking in both offensive power as well as protection of the soldier inside. They simply weren't able to match the technical specs of the clan design with the available technology. Unable to carry both the short-range missile pack and jump jets, each suit was forced to carry one or the other, which limited tactical flexibility. The thinner, more boxy armor meant the soldiers had to be more wary of being hit with small arms fire than their elemental opponents. Still, the programs were pushed forward. Among the other great houses, progress was being made to improve the basic functionality and capabilities of an inner sphere battle armor. It can be inferred that since the end results of these programs are shockingly similar, that information was being shared, willingly or not, between the Free Worlds League, Draconis Combine, and Compellan Confederation. It's also possible that many of these features are quite common sense, and the fact that they were all copying the elemental design also played a part in their curiously similar results. Though the basic Inner Sphere battle armor was being produced by 3052, it was in very small batches reserved for elite units. Sometimes called the Gorilla Suit by those who work with it, due to its general appearance and bulk, the one-ton battle armor does offer at least some of the protection and force projection of its clan counterpart. That was enough for each of the houses to put the suits into full production. Factories, including but not limited to Illyria, Capella, Hesperus II, Sian, and Stuart were put to work to quickly equip as many soldiers as possible to help give the respective houses an advantage on the field. The Inner Sphere standard battle armor does offer some flexibility through the use of its modular weapon mount. On the right arm, it can carry things like the flamer, machine gun, small laser, or even a single shot SRM-2. The left hand has a claw, though with less dexterity and strength as one might find with a clan elemental. Ground speed is limited, but the jump jets offer an equivalent range boost to their clan counterpart. Since those early years, both the technology and the aesthetics of the Inner Sphere battle armor has improved. Each of the houses has started to customize and differentiate their armor to specific needs and wants. Even as newer designs are created, the standard Inner Sphere battle armor is likely to be common on the battlefield for many years to come, just from the fact that so many are still in existence at the dawn of the Oak Clan era. It's cheap, made from readily available parts, and offers just enough protection to make the whole effort worthwhile. Our next interesting battle armor design is a newer entry from Clan Jade Falcon. Not ones to sit on their laurels as Clan Wolf upgraded their elemental design, the Falcons were quick to rebuild their Tumen following the word of Blake Kerfuffle. One of the upgraded elemental designs was the Stormbird battle armor. Due to some questionable decisions, as well as the chaos caused by the Wars of Reaving, the Jade Falcon scientist case was lacking in both number and capability. Still, a considerable number of resources were devoted to the project. Ultimately, the Falcons had to seek outside support from Clan Snow Raven. Now a joint project, the Ravens would benefit from the design specs in exchange for sharing their technical know-how to make design and production possible. 
The end result was met with muted response from Clan Jade Falcon. They had wanted a heavier suit that could bridge the gap between the capabilities of the Elemental and the heavier Ironhold battle armor. What they got with the Stormbird was battle armor which mimicked a lot of the capabilities that were already found in suits like the Salamander, and the Ravens, on the other hand, were very pleased by the design and ended up producing far more of them than the Falcons ever did. Even after the Jade Falcons spitefully tried to stop production with a trial. Since then, the Stormbird has really become more of a Clan Raven Raven Alliance design, as attempts to find a purpose amongst Jade Falcon forces has led to less than stellar reports from Elementals and commanders who prefer other designs. The Ravens have deployed the Stormbird to great success against pirates operating in the periphery. In May of 3147, after a force of Salama troops went missing, members of the Raven Watch were sent to find out what happened. Using their Stormbird suits, they not only located the dead Ravens, but also stumbled upon a fully functioning military installation located within an ancient SLDF base. The armor performed well, allowing the Raven Watch to survive, gather intel, and lay down covering fire while retreating. Though a considerable portion of the force was lost, the suits were credited for saving the rest. Due to the diverging development of the technology, there are two versions of the final armor. The standard Stormbird battle armor can move swiftly across terrain, but lacks jump jets, which is a significant cost for those considering a switch from standard elemental battle armor. The Jade Falcon version of the armor has jump jets, but is slower over ground, and cannot jump as far as your standard elemental. The armor is the same between both designs at 13, and each has a basic manipulator in the left hand. For weapons and equipment, the standard Stormbird is equipped with a heavy flamer on the right arm and an advanced short-range missile launcher 3 in the left shoulder that has enough ammo for 5 shots. The firepower offsets the lack of jump jets a bit, but getting in close with the SRMs could be a challenge even when moving that 22 kph. The Jade Falcon version of the Stormbird is equipped with an anti-personnel Gauss rifle with 20 shots, an SRM-3 with 4 shots, and magnetic clamps. While obviously focused more on hunting down opposing infantry, the inclusion of the magnetic clamps fits well with the need to offset the movement speed limitations of the Stormbird, as well as taking advantage of the Jade Falcon tactical doctrines of the Dark Age and early Ilkhan era. If I had to pick one or the other to take into battle, the most frequent choice would be the Jade Falcon version. While that heavy flamer is tempting, the lack of jump capability is going to make it very difficult for me to move them close enough for shot without taking fire. At least with the Jade Falcon design, your ability to jump will make it much more difficult for that incoming fire to wipe them out. This is applicable to most battle armor, by the way. They're squishy, so if you're going to take away that jump capability, there would better be a significant boost elsewhere in the exchange. Our next battle armor is being included in the list because I swear it looks like it's wearing a hat that probably has a specific, more accurate name, but I'm just going to say Fedora because you all know what I mean. The Tin Star is a medium battle armor produced by Hilltopper Engineering within the Franck Reaches. I was going to reserve this bad boy for the Franck video, which is still being written, but I couldn't resist tossing it into the fray here as well. Hilltopper Engineering is a venture which started as a spin-off from a mercenary group known as the Holtz Hilltoppers. Using their technical and engineering experience, the creators of the Tin Star shocked their neighbors with a newly designed battle armor which packs a significant punch. Original designs for the armor included clan weaponry and parts, but this was backtracked later after demands that all the parts of the suit be domestically produced. As always, periphery states, especially the smaller ones like the Franck Reaches, are fearful of foreign entanglements, which can end up resulting in colonization or serfdom under some outside power. The original design of the Tin Star sported a mag-shot Gauss rifle with 10 shots, a support PPC with 15 shots, and an anti-personnel weapon with magnetic clamps. The standardized and production-run design that you're going to see out on the battlefield has a David Gauss rifle instead of a mag shot. The original design had 10 armor, but the production standard only has 7. The Tin Star can run at approximately 33 kph, but lacks jump capability. This places the armor at the speedier end of the movement spectrum for battle armor, but still facing the tough choice to accept being a slightly easier target to hit without those jump jets. The Tin Star was designed to be rugged and easy to maintain, with sourced local parts, repairs, and replacements that are much more reliable than a battle armor design purchased from outside the Franck Reaches. After roughly a decade of trying to repair, replace, and build battle armor to keep soldiers equipped, 
The Tin Star promised to streamline the process and save countless hours of work. Now more than 75% of the Tin Star Brigade is equipped with the battle armor from within the Franck reaches. After losing the planet Detroit, the Franck leadership feared the loss of manufacturing, so they put considerable effort into building redundancies in the production lines for their homegrown battle armor. This concern proved well-founded as the factory on McEvan's sacrifice was raided in 3135 by a band of pirates piloting light mechs. While the pirates were able to use their speed to their advantage and blew past the responding colonial martial mechs, at the facility, a platoon of soldiers equipped with tin stars waited in ambush for the pirates to arrive. Three out of the four pirate mechs were swarmed and torn down by fire and claw. The fourth barely escaped. The two drawbacks I see for the Tin Star are the lack of jump jets, as I previously stated, and the limited ammo for both of the primary weapons. After 15 shots of each, that battle armor is going to be down to just using its anti-personnel weapon. This is going to limit the Tin Star from operating well in long engagements or campaigns unless there is plenty of ammo available. Such draws on resources could be considerable if whole units are equipped with the battle armor. It remains an impressive accomplishment for such a minor periphery power to produce their own functioning battle armor design, especially when there's so much focus on creating domestic battle mech production in other states. Plus it has a silly hat. We're going to wrap this video up with a very special nod to one of the most insane battle armor designs I have yet to see in Battletech, with the intent of creating an assault class battle armor which could bring a significant amount of firepower into the field, Starcore Industries created the infamous Tortoise 2. As the fearsome name would suggest, the Tortoise is sure to make an impact at your next backyard battlefield cookout, though keep in mind, while traveling at just 11 kph when geared up, it's not going to be arriving on time. On the modular turret mount, the Tortoise 2 can carry a Clan SRM-6 with 3 shots, a Clan LRM-4 with 7 shots, or an Advanced SRM-3 with 8 shots. The standard design also carries an ER medium pulse laser and two light machine guns. That's undoubtedly a lot of firepower for the battle armor. While the weapons are impressive, I just cannot get past the fact that this is just a totally impractical idea. You have a quad design where the pilot is presumably laying down on their stomach with wheels on the back. It would just be easier to either make a vehicle with four wheels or create a genuine quad which would then benefit from the climbing capabilities. The thought of seeing the Tortoise 2 trying to drag its way up some sort of steep incline stretches one's ability to suspend disbelief. Let's just hope that whatever Tortoise 2 machines that survived the fight for Terra are mothballed before they get any users killed. If you disagree, please let me know. I want to see who could defend this crime against logical design. Oof, they can't all be home runs, right folks? So that about does it for today's trip down Battle Armor Lane. There are still plenty more out there, so we may have to keep going. The nonsense train has no brakes. Thanks for coming by. Don't forget that free action of hitting the like and subscribe buttons. It's mostly painless. Big thanks to the Ko-Fi supporters and channel members who are taking that extra step to directly support this and future nonsense. I appreciate it. Until we meet again, take care and go make the world a slightly better place today and tomorrow.